represents the darkest side of human nature. The side of human nature that's capable to commit unspeakable acts. You strangled her right there. Eventually, somebody found the bones. We asked him why you did this, and his reason was just taking care of business. One detective asked me, if you had to do it over again, what would you do? I said, I'd put them all in one hole and you'd never find them. Serial killer Arthur Shawcross. A river runs through the heart of Rochester, New York. The mighty Genesee helped build this industrial city, where corporate giants Kodak and Xerox established their headquarters. But the river is also where a notorious serial killer dumped the bodies of most of his victims, one by one. He became known as the Genesee River Killer. Once you kill somebody, killing somebody else is a snap of a finger. His name is Arthur Shawcross. Over a two-year period, he instilled fear throughout the city as he murdered at least 11 women. I was convicted of 11, suspected of 19 more, and, you know, I'm not going no farther. He preyed mostly on prostitutes, strangling and suffocating them with his bare hands. They weren't kicking it at all. You know, you hit the pressure point, you don't move. He mutilated some of the bodies and even claimed to have eaten their flesh. I don't know why I did it. It just something happened in the spare of the moment. That was it. As the body count grew, the Rochester Police Department formed a task force that would become the largest in the city's history. We uh, had a conference room, which we called the War Room. Photographs of the uh, deceased were put on the wall. Any information that was gathered was put on the wall. The task force worked around the clock. Long hours, winter time, freezing, you know, 18 hour days. It, it, was, it was rough for a year and a half. The entire city of Rochester was unnerved. There was an ominous cloud that kind of hung over the community. Certainly it's true it hung over law enforcement. From top to bottom, everybody was concerned about getting this guy. It all began on March 23rd, 1988 when a hunter stumbled upon a body in Salmon Creek and called police. The victim was identified as 27-year-old Dorothy Blackburn, a known prostitute. An autopsy revealed that she had been strangled. Dorothy was a tough street hooker, and she, she, if somebody tried to hurt her, she would fight. Uh, she wouldn't take any garbage. The city was hit hard by the crack epidemic and certain areas like Lyle Avenue were flooded with prostitutes working for quick drug money. There's so many girls around, it was like a joke. Loaded with prostitutes, loaded with hookers, absolutely. Up and down the street, 24-7. Dorothy worked on Lyle Avenue, and to police, her murder seemed like a routine homicide. It's a dangerous occupation. It could be a John that uh, didn't want to pay. Uh, it could be uh, her, uh, her pimp. So we, at that time, we had no idea. Seven months later, a man was rummaging through debris in the woods down by the Genesee River Gorge when he saw what he thought were the skeletal remains of a deer. Then he saw clothing nearby and called police. The body was so badly decomposed, it could not be recognized. We had to recreate her face. We had the, uh, the skeleton recreated into an actual face. After seeing the recreation in the newspaper, her father identified the woman as 28-year-old Anna Steffen, a prostitute from Lyle Avenue. The medical examiner ruled the cause of death as probable asphyxiation. Still, police didn't think the two murders were connected. In any urban area where prostitution occurs, there may be violence involving prostitutes. So I think initially there wasn't a real alarm. Almost a year passed before police were called to the river once again. This time, it was the body of Patty Ives, a Lyle Avenue prostitute found on October 27, 1989. There were three prostitutes that we knew were prostitutes on Lyle Avenue, and, it, and, and, and they were hidden. And it's not like, you know, somebody uh, drags a prostitute in the alley and stabs her and leaves a lay. Somebody took the time to hide these bodies. And that's when I thought that we had a serial killer in Rochester. The police put Lyle Avenue under 24-hour surveillance and warned the women there to be on guard. We were telling them to be careful, uh, you know, uh, work in pairs. If you're going to work the streets, you know, uh, work with somebody you know. Uh, don't be alone and uh, be very cautious. But it was business as usual for the elusive serial killer. 
Despite the massive police presence, the killings became more frequent. It was very frustrating. I mean, we had the area scoured with our tactical unit, um, undercover uh, police officers, and apparently he was picking up girls right under our noses. On a cold Thanksgiving day in 1989, police responded to another body found near the Genesee River. It was a deserted area. Her body was found under a, a carpeting by a young man walking his dog. And at that point, there was just this feeling of helplessness because it seemed that no one was going to stop the individual who was uh, killing these women. The victim was 29-year-old June Stott. Can you tell us something about her physical condition? Describe how the body was? No, we can't because that's all investigative information. What police wouldn't say was that June Stott's body was unlike the others. June Stott was entirely different. She'd been subjected to a post-mortem mutilation, a very deep wound from the top of the chest uh, down to the vaginal uh, area, and uh, had been eviscerated to a certain degree. It seemed the killer was growing bolder and more disturbed with each victim. The FBI was called in to help create a profile of the suspect. One of the first things we did is go out and take a look at the area, the crime scenes, where the bodies were dumped, get a look at the River Gorge area. They felt that the location of the dump sites was a clue to the killer's identity. People choose dump sites because they're comfortable or familiar with the area. Probably a fisherman or familiar with that gorge area uh, for reasons besides the, uh, besides the homicide itself. The victims were also most likely familiar with their killer. How is he getting these victims? These women are terrified on, on the street. And the answer um, we felt was that he was a regular customer and that they knew him. And therefore they weren't afraid to get into a car. The FBI believed the offender was most likely a white male with a history of violent crime who held a menial job and was probably married or had a girlfriend. He was likely a known John in the area and also a hunter or fisherman. But other than that, he would appear nondescript. We felt that he was uh, extraordinarily ordinary. That the victims and maybe even the investigators were looking right through him. McCrary also suspected that the mutilation of June Stott after she was killed was a sign of things to come. We might uh, might see this sort of behavior again. Maybe we could catch the guy coming back to the uh, coming back to the scene. Even with the profile, the police weren't able to stop the killer from plucking women off the street. In a single month, December 1989, four more women were reported missing. One of them was Darlene Trippy. She didn't come home for Christmas, and that was her favorite holiday. So I kind of knew then and there that she wasn't with us anymore. Police began using a helicopter to try and find the bodies of the missing girls. On January 3rd, 1990, a state police helicopter spotted one and circled around. And as they got closer, they saw that a, uh, a gray uh, Chevy was parked directly over the body uh, on the side of the road. The helicopter radioed for ground support and followed the car as it drove several miles to the Wedgwood nursing home where the driver parked and went inside. When police arrived, they asked the man who was driving the car to come outside and talk. Is this a coincidence that he happened to stop on this road directly over the body, just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time? They weren't sure if the mysterious man was connected in any way to the murders in Rochester, but they had plenty of questions, and a suspect more than willing to talk. I didn't have to tell them nothing. You know, they ask a question, I answer it. On January 3rd, 1990, police began questioning 44-year-old Arthur Shawcross outside the Wedgwood Nursing Home in Spencerport, New York. They wanted to know why a helicopter had just spotted him near a dead body. He wanted to know what was he doing parked on Santa Road, so I told him I just had to yearning. Shawcross wasn't under arrest, but the investigators asked if he would go with them to the state police barracks. I said, you know, we need to get out of here. You know, it's just a lot of people around. It's awfully embarrassing. And I don't want to, I don't want you to be embarrassed. You mind coming with me? Shawcross agreed and even signed consent forms allowing police to search the car and his house. He was as calm as he could be. He was as cooperative as he could be. And it was almost as if he, he wanted 
not to draw attention to 